one final conversation. I'm excited to introduce Vance Checkett. He is with Dell-EMC, right? <laughs> Thanks, Vance. Thanks, Vance. Thanks, Vance. <clears throat> So Vance, again, is one of those great champions in the community. Um, you have long been a champion, as I've watched you, from all of your positions, inside of all the various acquisitions, all the way to Dell. And even in our community, you think deeply about these, and you try to really create a culture that um, is really inclusive, which we appreciate, and I think your community, you know, the community at large appreciates. So tell us a little bit about, um, as a corporation, what Dell EMC is doing around, I I think the group is called Women in Action, right? So you have a very formal initiative that tries to drive these changes. Yes, we do. So it's great to be part of a, <clears throat> a big company. We're actually now the world's largest privately controlled information technology company, if you didn't know that little statistic, uh, that is Dell EMC. And, it, and when you're a big company, you have different challenges and different opportunities yep. when it comes to things like uh, promoting women or promoting diversity, um, accountability. Um, one of the things that we do have, and, and we had a, a, a different entity, you know, prior to the combination right. with Dell, it's now called Women in Action. And it really is just one of several different resource groups that we have for our team members to come together around some common themes. So we have another one for Pride, which promotes LGBTQ. We have another one for veterans. We have another one for, um, uh, you know, tech innovation. So we have all these different communities inside our company that allow people to come together around these common topics. So what have you seen um, is the impact of creating those groups on the performance of teams and employees inside the company? Oh, it's been phenomenal. Yeah. Having these resource groups has been so great. It gives people opportunities for leadership that they might not have in their day job. So we have someone, and in fact, uh, you know, the person who runs our Women in Action group, we've, I've got several, I'm looking at, you know, the team here <laughs> on the second row. Um, but one of the people that runs the Women in Action group is in an individual contributor role um, in her day job. Yeah. Um, and doesn't really have an opportunity to lead a team, uh, but yet leads this big organization. And what a cool opportunity to get some exposure, not only in a leadership capacity, but then she's interacting with the leaders from all those other groups. Right. She's interacting with me on a regular basis, and, and, and it's just been fantastic. That's really cool. Actually, that's a really great insight, too, is that it creates this matrix opportunity inside of an organization. That's right. And I kind of always wear the hat of whatever opportunities you're given, you should jump at them yes. because they create this combination of momentum for you. So you've been part of our CEO roundtable also from the very beginning, helping us formulate ideas, try to figure out where we take this and how we create ultimate impact in the organization. And we, I remember at one of the very first meetings, I told you this, that, um, so Vance, at one of our very first meetings, we were talking about this issue, and I, I'm always really reflective and thinking about how we create these cultures of inclusion. And Vance said to me, he said, Sid, you have to stop thinking, and, and I agree with this, right, about, or don't ever talk about these as women issues. You should think about them as men's issues. That was like your exact quote. And I appreciated kind of that reflective sentiment. And what did you actually mean by that? And what caused you to say that? You're just now asking me what just I meant now. by that? <laughs> That's right. Exactly. For the benefit of the crowd. Uh, uh, no. I, and I know this is an ongoing conversation. I think it's really important. I mean, you know, it, it, if calling, you know, whatever, you know, if you want to talk about hiring and the lack of diversity and you want to call that women's issues, you know, to me, that just, it puts women in a negative light. It puts them in kind of this victim mode that we don't want to perpetuate That's at right. all. And when you go look at it, I was just, uh, you know, before I came up on the stage, I just thought, I'm just going to do a little impromptu analysis and look at KSL.com and see what the headlines are. Um, it was sad to see the headline about President Pershing, but I, I have to go read about that a little bit later. Sounds like he announced his plans to resi re resign, which was unfortunate. That's a whole other topic. For That's a, a whole other topic. <laughs> um, but <clears throat> it's interesting. When you look at just like violent crimes, just look at the violent crimes on KSL.com right now. Uh, there's one or two, you know, where there's a woman, you know, who's, you know, maybe the, the target. But the majority of them are men. It's men that are perpetuating violence against not just women, but other men. <laughs> you know, it's the men that are, ones, that are the ones that are making the poor decisions around hiring and the way they run their companies. <laughs> so That was a really good leap from the two. Well, <laughs> it's, 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 not a, it's not a huge leap. It's all abuse 
in different forms. It's all what I call aggression in different forms. There's macroaggression, which is, you know, rape and, you know, all those other horrible, horrible things that we, that we all know are bad. But the microaggressions, right, we socially accept all the time. And we even perpetuate them when we talk about, well, these are women's issues, Sid. You know, these are women's issues. No, they're not. They're our issues, really. You know, so even calling them men's issues is maybe swinging it too far you know, in the other direction. But it gives the, the dramatic effect that I think we need to have, which is, no, 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 no. This is not your stuff. This is my stuff, and it's our stuff together. And until we stop you know, calling it, those kinds of, you know, exclusive, mm -hmm. you know, th oh, it's your thing, we're not going to really be able to solve these problems. I actually really agree with that. <laughs> and so does our audience, because the only way we solve this is by working together. That's right. Right, we, no in one individual can solve it, and I think it requires this combined effort to say, we want and expect this from our companies, the places we work, our communities for the next generation. And by doing so, we have to make um, really specific changes. I think one of the things we often talk, what we believe is that a lot of times it just came out of what's called unconscious bias. Like no one intended quite often for it to be someplace where um, you know, women aren't feeling like they can be in those roles. Just an interesting stat for our conversation. So 38% of all women who go into technology jobs leave those jobs after seven years but stay working. And they cite that they move jobs because of culture reasons. So I look at that and I go, for all those women we put in pipeline, we lose them all after seven years, and we, and we need their talent in the workforce. And so I, I think we've been really focused on, like, how do we come up with those list of things that help build our community better and change conversations? And the reason we went after including men on the CEO roundtable is because we knew we needed this collective group. So as you think about these changes that we need to make to move us there, what do we do? Well, we certainly need to focus on like that loss, you know, of of uh, women and and anyone who's going into a STEM field. There's loss, and there's loss on the men's side as well as the women's side. But and, and so we should certainly do that. The other thing that I'm really passionate about, um, and and I think you know this is, you know, because I got involved in a piece of legislation this last go round, which is turned into this thing called the Computing Pathways Initiative, which is to get more exposure to computer science to kids earlier in their education. Yep because we need that pipeline to be bigger because there will be some loss you know, sure. as kids get into high school and college. The problem is that it's not, we're not putting enough kids into the funnel at the very, very beginning. So we need to get more exposure. We need to empower kids earlier, all kids, men and women, um, into you know, to thinking about these kinds of opportunities and these possibilities, and it is a struggle. Um, it really is a struggle because we have a lot of the leaders of the organization saying, well, our kids aren't asking, you know, to, to, to study computer science. And, uh, you know, my kid isn't interested in computer science. And that's where we have to say it's not even about computer science. It's not like we want them all to be computer scientists. But if they got exposed to that, I don't care what job they take right. in the future, technology is going to be a part of it in some way. And if they understand that better, yeah, they might actually choose a STEM job. And if they don't, they'll be much better equipped for whatever job. You know, the statistic yep. that I used that really got this legislation um, a lot of attention um, on Capitol Hill was the comparison of a couple of uh, AP uh, right. tests. And, you know, for, you know the answer to this. But last year in Utah, the number of kids that took the AP history test, anyone want to guess what that number is? AP history high school students last year, how many took the test? Anyone want to guess? No, AP history. This has you know, been around for a long time. 40,000 kids. 40,000 kids took the AP history test last year in Utah. Now guess how many took the AP computer science test? Just over 100. So, and guess how many of those were, were girls? 12. There was 12. So it was about 10%. So, so th you know, yep. that's a really, really dramatic example, I think, of what we need to do to get exposure to our kids much, much earlier. Right. And, and it's an investment for lo the long term. We should do things like the engineering initiative and, and, and universities, and we should definitely focus on our high school kids, but we need to do it at the very, very beginning. And we need people who are willing to get back in the community a little bit and who are willing to go mentor these kids as well. Yeah. I mean 
you know, we totally agree. We'll have over we'll have over two thousand girls who came through She Tech this year. Yes, uh, which is aligned exactly with this idea. Fantastic, right? And obviously, you guys are, are big partners. But I think you're highlighting that. Um, you're also making me feel we have a lot of work to do across the entire continuum of all the way from our K through 12 into our companies and into the C-suite. And I think um, just circling back to the conversation or the, the comment that you mentioned a little bit ago, which it was around this has to become our problem to solve. So give us your kind of last piece of advice on how are we going to solve this? It's our problem to solve. What's one of the things that we should walk out of this meeting and start doing that could create impact? Oh, there's so many things that come to mind. It's hard to give like it that is. one last little nugget. But you know, the, the thing the thing that probably strikes me the most, and you know, I think you're a good example of it, Sid. You know, is the way we we judge people. You know, and you talked about the what was it called? The unconscious unconscious bias. Unconscious bias or implicit bias. There's lots of things around that. If we could just all stop and be a little bit more aware of the way that we view other people and even ourselves. I think that would go a really, really long ways. And uh, one of the things that I've been asked to do with several of our, you know, incoming, you know, hires is give my little diversity and inclusion speech. And one of the things that I tell people is to uh, to be chin up, um, and and I mean that in two ways. Number one is kind of you know an an attitude of optimism and kind of you know keep your chin up, but the other one is really subtle and really important. And it's the way that you engage with other people, which should be from the chin up. You have much fewer chances of kind of letting your biases in when you start focusing on everything else other than someone's face. And sometimes it's even just their eyes. You really just need to kind of even bring it down to their eyes because hair can get in the way and other things. Um, <laughs> So, so that's one little trick that I use, is to always try and be chin up. And chin up in terms of my confidence and my optimism, but chin up in terms of the way that I interact with people and try to you know, in connect with them and, and not judge them, is by focusing on you know, the essence of that person. So uh, it may sound a little warm and fuzzy, but uh, I think we could all do a better job by being chin up. Thank you. Join me in thanking Vance Tuggets for joining us here. Thank you, Vance. Thanks,